Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Abby Zidal, and I'm coming to you for our book club favorites discussion from Studio 4 at Simon & Schuster. Today, we're going to be talking about The Stationery Shop, written by Marjan Kamali, and we are very lucky today to have the author joining us for our description, for our description, our discussion, (laughs) along with my friend and colleague, Eliza Hansen, also a fan of the book. So we're really excited you're joining us. We're going to talk a bit about this wonderful book, hear from Marjan about her inspiration for writing it and some of the details. But most importantly, we want to have a discussion that you want to get involved with. So please put your questions in the comments. I'll be getting notices on my phone. I'm not bored. I'm not checking out. I'm looking for your comments. So please uh, ask a question. Not only do we want to have you participating in the discussion with us, but we're going to incentivize you because if you ask a question, you'll be entered in our giveaway because five people are going to win not only a copy of this wonderful book, but also a copy of next month's book, which is The Winemaker's Wife. So what's not to love? All you got to do is ask a question that you wanted answered anyway, and you could win two great books. So. Um, Without further ado, let's get started. The Stationery Shop is a wonderful novel with two timelines, a historical timeline and a present day timeline set originally against the backdrop of uh, political upheaval in Tehran in 1953. And it also has a wonderful uh, unfolding of that story into the present day. So that's a very rough uh, description of it, but Marjan, Mm. let's turn to the expert. Can you tell the folks a little bit more roughly about this book? Sure. Um, The Stationery Shop is a love story. It's about two teenagers who fall madly in love when they're 17 in 1953 in Tehran, and they slip briskly, as F. Scott Fitzgerald (laughs) says, into an intimacy from which we never recover. I love that quote. It's the (laughs) epigraph to the book. Um, And they have this whirlwind romance and they're supposed to get married, but on the day of their wedding, the country erupts into a coup d'etat. And Roya, our heroine, never sees Bahman uh, show up that day, and then she tries to find him, but to no avail. So she resigns herself basically to a life without him, and she moves to the U.S., she marries Walter, she tries to forget about him, but do you ever really forget? And then 60 years later, they reunite in an assisted living center in Massachusetts. Uh, Now, that sounds a little like we just gave you the whole book. And really, we didn't. There's so, so much to it. Uh, Eliza, you're a big fan of this book. What was it that first connected you to it when you started reading? Um, Jackie Cantor, who's our editor, pitched it in our editorial meeting. similar to The Notebook, which is a favorite book of mine. I'm sure it's a favorite of many of yours. Um, And I put my hand up immediately to read it. Um, I fell in love instantly with Roya and Bauman's um, story. It's so unique and inspiring. Um, The tension between the political upheaval and their sort of intense romance was immediately jumped off the page to me. Um, I loved reading also about the Iranian culture and food is a huge player in this book. Um, I was hungry the whole time, um, but I really did love it. And I uh, gave a copy to my mom, I gave a, who gave it to my grandma, who then wrote back um, a nice note to Marjan. So yeah. I've been an early adopter of this book and I uh, fell for the love story, but I've also fallen for the culture um, and sort of the story and the history that come with um, the sort of B plots. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Could you? Um, I love what the story you told about how you have now sort of three generations of women yeah. connecting over this book, and family mm. is such a key part of this story. Could you talk a little bit about your thoughts about it as you were writing the book, or the importance of that theme to this book and? and to the culture you were unpacking? Yeah, you know, uh, people sometimes ask me, like, why is there so much food in the book? And it's impossible, first of all, when they ask that, I'm like, is there? But of course there is, but it's impossible to write about the Persian culture without writing about the food because these feasts, and they're actual feasts, happen on a regular basis when you have these social gatherings. And family, likewise, you know, family, the family bonds that are explored in the book, I think 
both empower the characters and also, without giving anything away, um, impede them. So I've always been fascinated by that tension between how much family can feed us and nurture us and basically help us in our lives. And the flip side of that is you do become beholden to certain duties and to certain bonds that can hold you back. Uh, that kind of relates, I think, to Roya's experience. You talk about this moment where the future she's envisioned, envisioned for herself kind of goes up in smoke in a way and how she makes a new future for herself mm -hmm. in the U.S. Can you talk a little bit about that shift in expectation and future and how it that how you worked to present that real shift in vision and that shift in the bonds that she thought she was forming? Yeah, you know, I think a big theme for me in writing this book was the idea of fate. And um, I grew up in the U.S. and I was always told you can be whatever you want to be. Um, your will will determine your future. On the other hand, the Persian culture believes that your fate is written in invisible ink on your forehead the day that you're born. So there's this idea of destiny and how much um, is actually predetermined for each individual. And one thing I wanted to explore was the tension between the choices we make that sort of determine our path and our future and the circumstances into which we're born that determine that future. And for Roya, when she's in Iran, uh, she has a very different idea of her life than the one she actually ends up living. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of great questions from the audience already. Thank you. Uh, Shelley wants to know, how long did it take you to research and to write this book? Mm. Good question, Shelley. Um, so basically, I read a lot about 1953. I read nonfiction sources. I read anecdotes online. I tried to educate myself because I'd always heard of this year, but I didn't know exactly what went down in that one day. But I was also in a position of privilege because I could speak to people who had lived through it. Mm -hmm. So I bugged a lot of older relatives, <laughs> and a lot of them didn't wish to get into it, but about a handful really opened up, and that was a huge part of my research, to basically just excavate from them what they had experienced that one summer. That actually connects to the next question we have from one of our readers. Mindy wants to know if the characters are based on any real life people. Mm. Can you say mm. or? <laughs> well, um, I made them up, but I will say this. Um, when I was doing book events for my first book, I visited an assisted living center and there was a, gen a gentleman there in a wheelchair who kept talking about all these things he'd done, like he met the Prince of Spain, he traveled with Charles de Gaulle, and people kept dismissing him and shushing him. And I later found out that everything he'd been saying was true. He was a very uh, famous Iranian dignitary in the Foreign yeah. Service. Everything wow. he'd been saying that day was true. That gentleman did form a kernel in my mind that helped fuel the book. He is not Bahman. Bahman's story is not his story, but that image is what started the entire story for me. That's amazing. How long ultimately did it take you to write this book, roughly? Uh, I keep spreadsheets in my writing, oh, so wow. I can tell you exactly. <laughs> um, the first draft took me two and a half years, mm -hmm. and then I kind of let it cool, and then I went back to it, and I revised it in a huge way, and that took an additional year. Uh, one of the things that uh, we haven't really touched on yet, but um, is the title is The Stationery Shop. It's not mm -hmm. Royal Baman, it's not a love story or whatever. Uh, so this is a very, very special place. And uh, Eliza and I were talking a little bit about trying to think about, do we have places in our own lives mm -hmm. that are like this place where Roya and Bauman could meet under the watchful and kindly eye of Mr. Mm. Fakhri. Do you have anything in your life that, or in your growing up where uh, it was sort of a Where I out? could meet a boy, no. <laughs> of course not, no. Um, but my, growing up my dad owned a mailboxes, mailboxes, et cetera, that 
was part stationary shop. So I grew yeah. up behind the counter and in the back reading and making drawings and okay. building things out of boxes um, and just being creative. And so that was sort of a sanctuary, I'd say, in my childhood. But also my local library was absolutely yeah. like my safe haven and space I was close with the librarians. They would put my favorite author's new books aside when they'd come in for me to take home and read story of everyone in publishing. <laughs> um, so those are my safe spaces. But And the stationer shop almost is part library's part. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. we think of a stationer shop here as you get awesome pens and paper, mm -hmm. but there were also books. And is this, uh, did you have a similar sort of memory of a bookstore or a stationer's like this that that was very vivid to you as you were creating yeah, this one? Yeah, I mean, stationery shops in Iran, even when I was a child, sold books as well. They were t a combination. And my dad once was telling me about a stationery shop during his youth that, of course, sold books as well as stationery. But he also mentioned that the owner of the shop would pass love notes between high school, like, uh, people with crushes on each other in high school who couldn't communicate. This is pre-internet, pre-texting. And he would pass their love notes in between the pages wow. of these books. Uh. And that's how they would correspond. And once he said that, I remember sitting there thinking, yeah, how am I not going to include that? Oh, you know? for sure. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We have another audience question. And it's a great time for me to remind everybody watching that if you would like to be entered into the giveaway, we are giving away to five people uh, a copy of Marjan's book, The Stationery Shop, as well as a copy of next month's uh, book club favorites pick, The Winemaker's Wife by Kristen Harmel. And all you have to do to be entered in this giveaway is ask a question, a question like Whitney asked. Whitney wants to know, how difficult was it to balance the two timelines Ooh. in this story? How do you do that? Yeah, you know, that is difficult. Um, my first book also had two timelines, and I remember saying to myself, my next book will take place during one day <laughs> in one room. But of course, I spanned 60 years with these two timelines. Um, I put on a very different hat when I was writing the 1953 scenes. And a lot of times when I was writing those scenes, I'll be honest, I was thinking in Persian and kind of translating. So. Oh, wow. The, the language there, if you, if you pay close attention, is slightly different. The texture is different. Mm -hmm. The syntax even maybe, it's a little bit richer. It's a little bit more maybe old worldly or otherworldly. And then when I was doing the Massachusetts contemporary scenes, I was just in a different mode. Mm -hmm. I think that absolutely comes through because to me, the, there's a quality of epic love story to this and the 1953 timeline had almost an oral narrative quality mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. It It's, while you wouldn't point to, oh, this turn of phrase feels very florid or poetical somehow, mm -hmm. but it just feels there's a bit of magic and legend, mm -hmm. even though I also was struck by how um, current and relatable their young romance oh, was, absolutely. you know? Yeah. Sometimes if, you know, to, to pick up Romeo and Juliet, which of course is iconic, but whether you're watching the Zeffirelli film or you're reading the play, mm -hmm. it's very um, exaggerated and stylized in a way. And, you know, they are gonna get married and then they're gonna kill each other. And you're like, okay, well, let's slow this <laughs> down a little bit. But I loved little descriptions like, um, they kind of have this impromptu just party at one of their friends' mm. houses, you mm. know? Mm. The group of friends and their interactions <laughs> felt both timeless, but also really timely. Mm -hmm. um, so I loved seeing that. And as a New England girl myself, oh. as is Eliza. Oh, yeah. So um, absolutely when I'm like, your early descriptions in Massachusetts, and I was like, this sounds familiar. And then I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's Newton? Yes. yes. Yeah, and, I, and I'm from Needham. So yeah, there's we're like, Newton, there's also Lexington Mass in mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yes. And I was like, oh yeah, this tracks. So <laughs> yes. uh, I love the way you vary that, because I think you absolutely do feel the change. Thank you. Um, but it's also really seamless. It just feels like a natural evolution. Um, Oh, and a nice general comment. People in the comments are loving the cover art, and Sylvia wants to know, can we talk about it? I would love to talk about this cover art because <laughs> yeah. we love it too. Yeah, I do love it. Um, why don't you tell us a little, what's it like 
to wait and see what mm. someone else thinks your book should look like because yeah. it's not like you get to draw it or necessarily suggest that much. Yeah, you know, people think that as an author, you sometimes people compliment me on my work on, on the cover. I'm like, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, it's really the anticipation is huge, and when the hard cover cover art arrived, I was floored. I was stunned because I felt it captured the tone of the book. It captured its spirit and this tenderness that mm. I hope yeah. is in my story. And then for the paperback, we had a new cover and there was a part of me that thought, no, no cover can be as good as that one. But then we have this cover, which again, I just feel I, it captures so much of the story. That's credit to the brilliance of the art designer the the people who who worked on this um, I feel like they put their hearts and souls into it yeah I think this book touched a lot of people here at Simon and Schuster and uh, not that everybody doesn't give their all for every book we do but I think it just encouraged so many people connected with it and as Marjan said the hardcover and the paperback covers are different but they look really kind of related this motif with the uh, flowers and the gold was picked up from the hardcover. I want like a jewelry box made out of your, yeah. your hardcover. And we kept yeah. saying we wanted wallpaper of it. <laughs> yes. Oh, we have another great question from the audience. Mm -hmm. Alana wants to know, if I were going to try to make one of the amazing dishes Ooh, that you describe in yes. the book, which one would you suggest and why? Uh, okay. So I get asked this question a lot. Um, I get asked for recipes weekly. Um, one of the dishes that, that that plays a huge role in the book is the dish that Roya first makes for Walter. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, sort of how they connect. They connect over her cooking this dish for him. It's what we call in Persian khorish de qayme, which is this stew that is sort of tart. There's a lot of tartness in Persian food, sweet and tart. And um, it's got split Pea, yellow split peas and beef, but she makes it with chicken. And then, well, I don't want to give away too much, but it comes back in the book. But I suggest uh, that everybody who wants to start out, just start out with something so simple, which is the crispy rice, mm -hmm. which is what we call tadik, which is the bottom of the pot layer of rice that gets golden and crispy. And it's a delicacy for a lot of Iranian people. It is not burnt. Please don't say it's burnt. <laughs> um, toasted. Toasted. It tastes like okay. popcorn. It's supremely easy to do. I, I can happily uh, share how to do that in a pot. Or you order a Persian rice cooker and like on Amazon and it does it for you. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. that's how I do it. Easy peasy. I'm like, yeah. or I'm, I bet there's some place in my neighborhood that I call for takeout. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. You guys do it so I don't mess it up. <laughs> But um, I'm excited to hear that there's some stuff that's easy. I loved reading about the cooking and that meal for for Walter. But I was like, I am more of a microwave girl, so I'm like, <laughs> yeah, mm, don't start with. I'll that. just read. Don't start with Just that. read about that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is there? Um, oh, never mind. I'm going to skip my question because Diane has a question. She wants to know: Is the ending of the draft of the book different from the finished product? Oh, that's it's such an interesting question. Yes, I am. <laughs> it is. Uh, my first draft had a different ending. Ooh. Um, I won't get into it because I don't want to give anything away. But I spent probably a good like six sleepless nights wandering about that ending. And those of you who've read the book, you know now that yes. the ending sort of turns everything on its head. And it took me a lot to kind of come to terms with that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, it is different. Uh, I just want to remind anyone who might be stepping in to join us during this discussion. We are part of Book Club Favorites, coming to you from Studio 4 at Simon & Schuster. We're having a wonderful discussion about this month's book club pick, The Stationery Shop, with author Marjan Kamali and my colleague Eliza Hansen, and I'm Abby Zeidel. We're glad that you joined us. And if you want to be entered for a giveaway to win one of five mm. copies of The Stationery Shop, along with a copy of next month's book club pick, please ask a question in the comments. Uh, I want to go back a little to the editorial experience. Mm -hmm. um, what is that like as an author when you, you've had someone 
choose your book and editors like I love it I want to buy it it comes in you've worked for I think you said two and a half years for the first draft on this um, what's it like when you get those notes mm. and and have someone else looking you know opining about this thing that's been yours for so long well, it's really helpful if you have an editor who gets your book from mm. the get-go. And with Jackie Cantor, I did have that. I do have that. Um, I knew it was a good sign when one of the first things Jackie said to me was that she couldn't stop crying. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. you get me. It so, lasted for months. Oh, every <laughs> time she mentioned crying. this book, she would start crying again. She would pitch it at sales conference and start crying. Oh it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I knew I knew we were on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you get those notes, again, if, if you're already sort of in sync with one another, the notes don't jar you. So some of the things that Jackie suggested, I remember sitting back and thinking, hmm, yeah, yeah, I guess I could redeem this character in mm. this one scene, you know. And one thing that we both agreed on that we were beholden to was the opening. And we both knew, and I'm giving nothing away by saying this, that you start that first scene in the assisted living center in contemporary Massachusetts, knowing that Roya is about to see her first love, who she hasn't seen for 60 years, and that they were apart this whole time. And for me to frame it that way meant the world. And from there, we just could make adjustments. Uh, Mary wants to know, do you have a special place mm. or a particular routine when you're writing your novels? Ooh. I do. I do, Mary. I didn't for a long time, and I would float around. But I'm finally at that stage where I have a room of my own. I'll start crying at this oh. <laughs> um, because it took decades. Um, but I do now. I have a room of my own. And I'm of the school where writing for me is incredibly personal. Um, I close the door. I literally pull down the blinds, don't talk to me. I'm in another planet. And it's a very internal, it's a cave. Mm -hmm. It's an actual cave and, well, not actual, um, but it feels like one. And, and then when I'm in there, I'm in the other world. Mm -hmm. And then when I retreat, I crawl out and everything is bright. <laughs> <laughs> Can you leave your, your half-done characters mm. in the cave for the next time you come back? Or are they haunting you when you come back out into the light. They are haunting you. <laughs> yeah. They're always at the back of your mind. So I'll be washing dishes and I'll be cooking and then I'll think, oh, that's why he did that. You know, and then sometimes I've learned the hard way. You must write it down because mm. then you forget. Mm -hmm. um, they're always with you. When you're doing the book, they're consistently with you. They're even with me now. And they're very real to me, by the way. Yeah. They're very real to me. Oh, I think too. Oh, I mean, I can only imagine since you created them, but I, they come off the page so richly that mm -hmm. I feel like they stay with a lot of us. Um, Karen in the comments just wanted to say, absolutely loved this book. Thanks, Karen. She says, thank you for this wonderful journey. Oh, and Athena says that her book club is meeting tomorrow oh. and she's reading your book and they are having the Persian stew. <gasps> Yeah. Good job, That's Athena. Exciting. Oh, amazing. Send us pictures. Post Please. pictures of it in the comments because we want to see how it turns out. Yeah. You know, I didn't intend for this to happen, but I get invited to a lot of book clubs and there's always a feast. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that was kind of a smart move that I included all these All the rest yeah. of the dishes. You're yeah. like, I haven't had to grocery shop in months. I've just been on tour. Yeah. No, it's fine. Yes. Uh, Eliza, uh, you are really great about, you know, I feel like you always have a book recommendation for someone. And uh, you already you mentioned that you thought, it's all right, I'm making it easy. Because you mentioned that people who like The Notebook would probably like this book. Absolutely. And um, uh, my question is twofold. You can answer whichever part is easier. One, is there a particular moment or scene in the book that stays with you or that's your favorite that you like to share with people when you're encouraging them, trust me, you're gonna love it. And two might be if there are other, if you liked this books that okay. they would like the stationery shop. Absolutely. Um, I think my favorite moment from this book is when Roya and Bob Mon finally step out of the shop together and mm. they aren't engaged and they aren't supposed to be alone 
together out in the world um, and she is fretting about what she's going to tell her family, her sister, her friends. And Bachman replies, you tell them that you went for a walk with your beau. Oh my gosh! And no, it, the fact that, that you remember, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> so excited about I do my own love lines. It's so pretty the fact that though. you remember it, yeah. Um, and it was just such a beautiful scene and I think one thing, I mean, as Abby said, Jackie was so very moved by your book and so emotionally attached to it and had the whole office clamoring to read it. Um, but one thing that she kept repeating is that I just feel like I'm 17 again. I just feel like I'm in love for the first time again. Um, and I definitely felt that reading your book. And I have a question for you. And that is, how did you so perfectly capture that sensation of the first time that you're in love and capturing what it's like to be young and feel so much hope and possibility for your future and just that heady feeling that we all remember. Where is your time machine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you where it is. Um, I sincerely believe, and again, at the risk of sounding a little crazy, I, I don't think time is linear. So I really believe when Roya is 77 in those scenes mm. and she's reconnecting with Batman that she's 17 also and um, obviously I drew on my own memories of youth um, clearly you have to do that but I also uh, I, I live with two teenagers so I, I <laughs> had a lot of that going on and um, I, I really believe that we're all the ages that we've been at any given time so I'm sitting here before you today but I'm also the 10 year old I'm also hopefully the future old lady yeah. that I will one day be. And I and I feel that for Roya, time is not linear. And there is that part of her, she was so shaped by that one summer that she can access it at any given moment. She mm. can be triggered by a smell. She can be triggered by something she sees or hears. And there she is again. That's part of her whole issue. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of love that because, um, and I will say, believe it or not, time unfortunately is still linear here and we have just a couple <laughs> of minutes left. So you guys out there watching, if you have any other questions, make sure you get them in now for your last chance to get in on this giveaway. Um, you can be one of five people to win a copy of The Stationery Shop. Uh, and I kind of love thinking about it this way because one of the interesting things is you have this incredible connection between Roya and Bauman, but Roya goes on and has a genuinely rich, mm -hmm. warm, mm -hmm. adult mm -hmm. marriage. Yep. And I, I, there's a point, and I'm like a sucker for romance at heart, and I was always like, don't know who to root for. So That's I'm like, right. I wanted That's everybody, right. but I feel like your outlook lets everybody have a happy mm -hmm. ending. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. the multiverse gives us all love somehow. Yeah, this right. is for Team Walter, because <laughs> I know there's a whole Team Walter group out there. <laughs> And Walter, who's Roya's um, actual husband, the one she does marry, is, in my opinion, incredible. And mm -hmm. he is not a compromise. And it's just that he's not Batman, but he is him. And they have an entire shared history. They certainly yes. uh, go through a lot together. So that's what I wanted. I didn't want one to be better than the other. That's too easy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, they both were Very different. the right choice for the right moment yeah. in her, or for the person who she was at that moment. Exactly. And they both loved her in different yes. ways. Yes. Yeah. And both loved her intensely. Yes. 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 Which she, she totally deserved. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys, this has been amazing. We have to wrap things up. I could go for another hour easily. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Marjan Kamali, for joining us and for writing the wonderful The Stationery Shop. Uh, thanks to everybody who participated. You asked us a question. You're going to be entered in the giveaway to win one of five copies of this amazing book. And I'm so excited for those of you who are already reading it. Uh, we definitely want to keep hearing from you in the comments because this is going to live on and uh, other people will get to see it. Eliza, thank you for joining My us. Pleasure. Thank you. This was such a treat. Thank you. And just a reminder to everybody for next month's book club pick which is going to be The Winemaker's Wife by Kristen Harmel. And our giveaway includes not only a copy of this month's The Stationery Shop, but also next month's book. So uh, congrats to everybody who jumped in there and asked a question and got entered for that giveaway. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. And uh, we will see you next month from Studio 4 and Book Club Favorites. Thanks so much, you guys. Bye.